All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Sarah Mount. I'm the VP of Marketing at International Market Centers, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Um, a couple quick housekeeping items before we go ahead and get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so um, if you would like to view the webinar afterward, we're going to be posting it on our website, and we'll also be emailing it out to everyone who is participating today. And in addition, we want to thank everyone who has submitted questions in advance of the webinar. We've got a lot of great questions and we're hoping to be able to answer as many of those as possible today during the talk. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions during this talk, there is a comments field in the Zoom interface so you can ask questions as we go. If we have time at the end, we'll address as many as we can. Um, however, if we can't get to all of them, which we probably won't, um, we are going to be sending out a Q&A as a follow-up at the end as well. So be on the lookout for that. Um, our hope is to get to as many questions as possible. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dorothy Belshaw to kick us off today. Dorothy? Thanks, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, a special hello to David Scholl, who just said hello to me in the chat. So. Straight back at you, David. Glad to see you or hear of you. Um, my name is Dorothy Belshaw. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of IMC, and I am so pleased to welcome you to this webinar today. It um, has been a long time coming, I think, for many of you, and we've been working hard. Um, our goal today is to deliver important information regarding our plans and our preparation, and to reinforce that IMC's number one priority during our summer markets is safety. In late April, four weeks after our buildings were closed to the public, IMC conducted extensive third-party research to understand the impact of the pandemic on our retail audience, to gauge the need for product after reopening, to identify preferred sourcing methods, and predict sensitivities around market attendance and travel. Armed with that information, we knew we could begin the process of planning for markets in a new and unfamiliar environment. Our survey results teased out four key takeaways. The pandemic had far reaching and significant impact on retailers of varying size, product focus and location. Recovery would be an extensive and complex process. Second, buyers across categories would need product immediately and increasingly over the 60 to 90 days post reopening. Third, as of April 30th, roughly 45% of our buyers indicated willingness to attend markets in August, and we rescheduled our summer markets accordingly. And finally, and most importantly, IMC would have to thoughtfully develop, communicate, and then implement guidelines and protocols to create safe and productive environments for our customers at all of our summer markets. So today we're here to talk about just that, Together Safely, an initiative designed to address and mitigate health and safety concerns and developed robust new protocols as we resume markets together. Together Safely is the culmination of seven weeks of extensive planning by a senior cross-functional team with more than 80 years of combined experience in market production. They're on the call today and they include Greg Abatabale, our COO, Karen Olson, our SVP of Marketing and Communications, Bob Schuler, our VP of Housing and Atlanta Convention Center, and Neil Patton, General Counsel. This team operates with the invaluable input and medical oversight of Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Hubert Professor and Chair of the Hubert Department of Global Health at Emory University School of Medicine. We have been incredibly fortunate to have had access to Dr. Del Rio's particular expertise in infectious disease throughout this process. Our team and Dr. Del Rio join us live today to review questions submitted in advance by our customers and to give you more information about our plans as to how we will get together safely this summer. So without further ado, let me turn the mic over to Neil Patton, who heads up our Together Safely Task Force. Neil. Thank you, Dorothy. I appreciate that. Um, I think you've lowballed that 80 years because 30 of them are mine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
almost as soon as the shutdown was ordered, uh, IMC was already beginning to plan for the eventual reopening. Eventual came a little sooner than we anticipated when Governor Kemp of Georgia on April 24th announced that certain businesses in Georgia would be reopening. Um, there were a lot of questions at the time. You may have asked them yourselves as to why we were not opening at that time. And the answer is simple. We couldn't in good conscience reopen our facilities uh, to face-to-face -face commerce until we were satisfied that it could be done safely. Uh, safety, as Dorothy indicated, has been the guiding principle through all of this. Um, to get there, there were a lot of bridges that had to be crossed. There were legal issues that had to be resolved, of course. There were human resource practices and policies that had to be rewritten. Um, we had to go to school on best practices, industrial hygiene. Um, most of all, there were medical issues. We, we had to get up to speed on what the, the medical thinking was about this. Rules needed to be established then and evaluated for their efficacy. We had to source uh, the personal protective equipment. Signs had to be manufactured and deployed. Changes had to be made to our physical, um, our buildings to accommodate some of these protocols. And then a communication plan had to be developed and implemented to keep our customers, all of our stakeholders informed of what was going on. That effort was uh, overseen by a task force that was made up of oh, more than a dozen internal subject matter experts throughout the organization in uh, all of our operational departments, as well as most of the back of the house departments, uh, legal, human resources, accounting, and certainly marketing. Um, we've been working hard and diligently as quickly as we can to get to a point where we can open safely. We had groups monitoring the governmental developments, which uh, if you're watching the news, you know those change on a dime. Uh, the medical guidance from CDC, World Health Organization, and others. Uh, we have an extensive network of contacts with some of the biggest companies in the hospitality, office, retail sectors, the uh, trade show and event industry. Also a wide variety of professional organizations. I suspect your inboxes are as full as mine of guidelines and protocols from uh, all of the professional organizations that touch on our industry. We were also fortunate in being a Blackstone portfolio company to have access to the resources of our ownership. Uh, we tapped into their subject matter experts and they have many on retainer, um, as well as the best thinking of the other portfolio companies. They shared our thinking, they shared theirs and uh, they were all grappling with the same issues we were, but we think that that enabled us to get to a kind of a state of the art result. Most importantly though, um, Dorothy has already mentioned that we engage the services of a world renowned expert in infectious diseases, Dr. Carlos Del Rio from University, uh, Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Del Rio has consulted with us um, at least weekly, usually several times a week throughout the process. Uh, he's helped us immensely to stay abreast of the science as well as the current understanding of the virus from a medical perspective, the best thinking of the medical field. And he has been looking over our shoulder, evaluating everything that we've done, every step we have taken as uh, his guidance and his buy-in. And so we, we feel very confident that um, the plan we've come up with is a good one, a sound one, and the safest one that can be accomplished consistent with uh, the guidance from government and government, quasi-governmental agencies. It was apparent from the beginning that we would need to reopen our buildings in phases. If you have, uh, if you've seen the plan, you know that we broke it down into four phases. The first, was that we, I think we have a, a video. Yeah, we do have a visual on that. Uh, the pre-opening phase uh, when we were getting ready to reopen. And that was largely about research, about sourcing materials, about manufacture of signs, of Lexan shields, um, installation of uh, hand sanitization equipment, and so forth. 
which led to phase two, reopening our buildings to daily business. Now, in the event, that happened in two stages because we were quite at the finish line. We began to hear from more of you that there was a need to begin doing commerce on a very limited basis. And so we accommodated with appointment only um, business for the past several weeks. Um, that went successfully, it went smoothly. And on the 8th of this month in America's Mart and this past Monday for the rest of the IMC campuses, uh, we've been open to daily business now. Uh, all appears to be going well so far. You will know that we had a small uh, apparel market last week um, that was our, our proving bed for some of these protocols and happy to report that all went well. Phase three, when we started down this road, was intended to be the next thing to happen chronologically, which would have been the, the recall to our offices of our employees. Um, in the event, with the, uh, the statistics on the, the recurrence of the disease, and with the realization that much of what we are needing to do can still be done effectively and efficiently remotely, uh, we have adopted a policy of bringing back employees as needed, when needed, for um, producing our events and uh, meeting the needs of our customers. Much of the back of the house will remain working remotely indefinitely. Phase four is the one I am sure most of you are concerned with. Phase four is when we resume markets and events. Um, apart from the small apparel market that we just hosted, um, we still have some work to do. The, the protocols are not finished and final. We have a very good idea of where we're going with our protocols for markets later this summer. But um, it's still very much a work in progress. Uh, and a lot will change between now and then. Um, we've been guided all along by what the lay of the land is, and the lay of the land is changing. The way the world looks now is very different from the way it looked a month ago and will likely be very different from the way it looks a month from now. There will be changes as we go. Um, but the basic outlines are in place, and many of those are included in the written protocol documents. I referred to those several times. Um, those were posted to the Together Safely website. Um, I hope you have taken the opportunity to look at those. They may have informed some of the questions that you're asking today. Um, we are well aware that some of you have reacted that our protocols are too prescriptive, that, uh, that we are being unduly harsh. We are asking you to do things that others in the, the business world are not doing. We've heard probably from an equal number of people who are concerned that we haven't gone far enough. They would, be prefer, they would prefer to see us taking the kind of steps that um, medical facilities and research laboratories are taking. What you are seeing is the best judgment, not just of our internal task force, but of all of the industry experts with whom we're in close consultation, the best balance between uh, providing you the safest environment we can and still allowing you a way to do business safely. Um, to that end, we have two goals that I want to highlight. One is that we have to be safe. The health of you, the health of our, all of our customers, our, our tenants, their customers, buyers, uh, designers, our staff, uh, the staffs of our service contractors, Keeping everyone healthy is goal number one. Everything else is a distant second. That said, there is a distant second, and that is we need to be seen to be doing the right things to provide a safe environment. It won't do us any good to keep you healthy if the customers don't come. So um, if you think that we are doing something like taking temperatures that somebody else isn't doing, please know that it isn't because we get a kick out of taking temperatures. It's because a good deal of the public associates these measures with safety, and we need people to feel safe if they're going to come. So um, the other point I want to make before I hand off to Karen is that um, inherent in these protocols, uh, every step that we have taken, every measure that we have taken, the underlying assumption is that anyone could have COVID. Um, that's the unfortunate reality. You know, it, as, as we do, that uh, you're not necessarily symptomatic and can still be contagious. So 
we assume that everyone could be, and therefore we assume that everyone is, and um, the measures that we are taking are designed to protect you and your staff and your customers and to protect you from each other. Um, that's why we are as insistent as we are on measures that some have expressed may not be strictly necessary. Um, we don't know who needs to be masked, so everyone needs to be masked, for example. Um, that's the background of the protocols. Uh, they're on the website for you to review. Um, I see some of you have because a number of the questions address issues in those. And we will get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the webinar. In the meantime, uh, Karen, I believe uh, you've got an update on marketing dimensions of the stack survey. Yes. Thanks, Neil. Um, uh, Sarah, if you want to just flip to the next slide, we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, so obviously, as Dorothy mentioned early on, we conducted an extensive survey early this summer. And from that, we've gathered that we should anticipate about 40 to 50% of our typical audience for a summer market. So that's still a significant number of people that we had to contemplate and plan for. And um, through that survey as well, there was the key message that we got from buyers was that their attendance is predicated on the assurance that there are certain health and safety protocols put in place for the market, as Neil was discussing earlier. So um, the, one of the first things we thought about was our registration process, you know, what needed to change in order to make sure that we could provide a safe and comfortable environment for people to register for market. Um, and so there were a few high level goals that we contemplated and guiding principles of our new process. So the first and foremost was we wanted to try to avoid as much personal contact as possible through a contactless registration process. Um, secondly, we wanna to try to prevent on-site registration lines whenever possible, therefore maintaining the proper social distancing at market. And then also, as we all know, having been to markets, there is always this um, ingress and egress, that early morning peak and that late evening peak that we had to contemplate where we knew we would have more people that we had to get in and out of our properties. And so how could we do that safely? Um, so there are a few new procedures that we've put in place for our registration process for the summer markets. First and foremost is we are requiring pre-registration for all markets. Now, this is not always been the case for our markets. It's a new process, it's new behavior. We're working hard to educate everybody on the need to pre-register for a market. And that pre-registration process is not just for buyers, that's anyone attending the market. So that's the media, that's our exhibitors, that's reps, that's industry people that are attending. So everybody, we are going to be driving to pre-register for the market. Now, we will have um, on-site registration available. It will be scaled down from previous markets, again, because we really want to encourage people to not utilize that on-site registration process and therefore create lines and gathering at on-site at market. Um, the other thing that we've done is for our major markets, we've split the market into separate sessions. So, we're having a session A and a session B, and we are asking buyers to register for one of those two sessions. And the objective there is really, as we know, we, we typically get um, much heavier attendance in the early days of market, and it slows down a little bit toward the end. By creating two sessions, we're hoping to spread that traffic more evenly across the full course of the market. And again, being able to maintain the density and social distancing within the campuses during market. Um, we know because we've already heard from some buyers that they need more than one market, more than one session, excuse me. Um, and we will accommodate special requests like that. Um, so people can reach out to us if you have a customer or you are a buyer that needs a longer period of time to shop, please just reach out to us and we'd be happy to accommodate that for you. But again, we're really trying to make an effort to disperse that traffic across the entire market by creating these A and B sessions within our markets. Um, that alone won't be enough in terms of dispersing traffic for some of our larger markets. So we will also be assigning entry times and locations, and in some cases, exit times and locations for our markets. Again, just trying to manage those peak hours in the morning 
where we know we will have more people arriving to market and then thus in the evening as people are leaving the market. Um, and so we want to try to make sure that we're using all entry and exit points that we can to get people in and out as safely and as efficiently as possible. Um, the procedures for each individual market will be different. Obviously, our, campus, our campuses are different. So um, the detailed nuances of the registration process for each of these markets will be communicated in more detail um, in the next couple of weeks. As Neil mentioned, we just had a, June, a small June apparel market um, where we tested a lot of our processes. And so we've learned a few things and we're tweaking a few things for our summer markets. And so we wanna make sure we get all those details ironed out um, and then we'll be ready to communicate that. And again, it will go out specific to each market because registration process for Las Vegas market, for example, will be slightly different than for the Atlanta gift and home market this summer. Um, and then Sarah, if you wanna just flip to the, the next page. Um, in terms of communication, again, um, we've got a few key communication vehicles that we wanna just point out to you and make sure that you're sort of keeping a lookout for. Um, we are sending weekly emails with updates related to our summer market. So those emails are coming from IMC, from Atlanta market, Las Vegas market, IMC High Point, and Atlanta Apparel. So please keep an eye out for those. Those do contain important updates related to our summer markets, as well as opportunities that you might want to take advantage of related to the summer market. So if for some reason you're not getting those emails, please reach out to us and we can determine why you're not getting those. But um, there's a lot of really important information that we're trying to communicate and it's changing. As Neil said, our processes, our procedures are changing as we learn more. So um, we want to make sure you stay up to date on all of those changes. Um, we've also created, as was mentioned, a, a specific website to talk about our safety protocols. It's called togethersafely.com. If you've not gone, gone there, please check it out. Um, the 30-page master Together Safely plan is posted there, so you can read that in all its detail. Um, we also have several resources and links to other important information on that website that may be useful to you. Um, we will also be updating this. So as things change, we will update this website. So this will always house the most current information about our health and safety protocols for the market. So a great resource if you haven't been there. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, the, the procedures and protocols are slightly different for each market. So the other communication vehicle that we are developing at the moment um, our specific showroom guides for each individual market. So um, over the course of the next couple of weeks, again, as we finalize some of the procedures and protocols around all aspects of our summer markets, um, we will be incorporating those into that showroom guidelines document and distributing that to all of our tenants. So um, again, keep an eye out for that. That will always be posted on our websites and also will be pushed out through these emails that I just referenced. So, um, so you'll be seeing that coming across um, very soon. But in the meantime, um, Greg Avatable is gonna go through just an overview of some of our most important health and safety protocols that we're putting in place for our summer market. So uh, over to you, Greg. Great, thanks, Karen, and good afternoon, everybody. So kind of building upon all the information um, that both North, Dorothy, Neil, Karen have, has provided, you know, we've been real busy with, you know, sort of transforming the on-site experience. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what we've done to prepare the facilities, our PPE requirements, and, and what we've purchased. And then we'll kind of get into, a little bit into, like, what the market experience um, we're envisioning is going to look like. We'll kind of keep it at some high-level strategies today in the interest of time, but know that we're, as Neil had mentioned, we're working on um, all the additional details that we need to, um, to pull together for each of the different markets. Um, so we're obviously looking at Las Vegas, uh, we're looking at Atlanta, you know, both gift home and apparel, um, and, to, and, and as well as High Point. So our campus preparations are, are pretty similar across each of the different campuses. You know, we've got the Together Safely program, and so we've, in, we've started installing Together Safely signage throughout each of the campuses. Um, the signage is, you know, meant to uh, inform people and provide directions. Um, we've got some slides here that we had taken just recently from the apparel market that we had last week, 
Uh, it was a great event. We were able to pressure test a lot of our strategies. Um, we found some things that we need to improve, but by and large, there were a lot of positive attributes and we feel really confident about our ability to execute. Um, also throughout the campus, we've got hand sanitizer dispensers. So we've installed over 1,500 hand sanitizer dispensers throughout the facilities. They're located in common areas. They're also located at uh, areas where elevators, escalators. So if people are getting you know, on and off vertical transportation, they can clean their hands. Um, so there's an abundance of locations where people can go ahead and use the house hand sanitizers. Uh, we've also fabricated over 200 Lexan shields. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left is our registration desk. These are customized shields that are both designed to protect our attendants, but also our, our guests. Um, those have been distributed around service desks, registration, security stations, um, and they've been really successful with, you know, creating that physical barrier that everyone is, is, is looking for. Um, we're working in our restrooms to install, uh, we have many restrooms that have, you know, touch, touchless accessories, whether they're faucets or soap dispensers or paper towel dispensers. So we've got a program that we're going through each of the campuses and, and working on retrofitting all of that. Um, our HVAC systems, you know, one of the things that we found out is, you know, frequency of changing filters uh, to keep the environment clean. Um, also increasing our fresh air intake um, as, equipment of, as equipment can has proven effective to, um, you know, just bring in fresh air and circulate throughout the facility. So those protocols are already in place. Um, and then for our back of house, like our doc appointments, we're really working on staggering our uh, appointments to, to maintain social distancing. Our team members are actually handling all of the product when they come in uh, and taking up into the facility and taking things out. Again, just to make sure that we can maintain social distancing and the, uh, the effectiveness of our operations. From the PPE standpoint, we've, we've made significant investments in face masks. We, we've purchased over 200,000 disposable masks. Um, we have uh, a supply of uh, plastic face shields. Those are for our frontline workers, but also if somebody has uh, a medical reason where they can't wear a, a mask, you know, we can make those available. Um, we've also purchased 160,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. So the middle picture on your screen here for everyone that, for buyers that come through the facility, upon request, you know, we can provide them a PPE kit which has a disposable mask. It has a two ounce bottle of hand sanitizer. And again, to be used with, in conjunction with the dispensers that we have, uh, and, and as well as hand washing capabilities, you know, that we have obviously in all, all of our restrooms. The PPE kit also contains um, a welcome back um, facility rules and regulations, what you should know, just helpful reminders as you're navigating around the campus of things you need to be mindful of. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, like 150,000 sanitary wipes. Most of our team is using that. Um, this is in addition to housekeeping for, for people in, that are staffing high touch areas. And for those of people in positions where they need to wear disposable gloves, we have 100,000 pairs of disposable gloves. So people that are handling other people's merchandise or they're you know, managing freight operations, food service, et cetera, housekeeping. Um, so obviously, a lot of thought and time has gone into the program, as you've heard. Uh, we've made the commitments and we're in really good shape with where we have retrofitted already on the facilities. So for market, the arrival experience, um, you know, we're really focused on the, you know, creating a centralized area uh, in each of, the, each of the buildings, if it's available, or a centralized area where we can go ahead and temperature screen and scan everybody for registration. We implemented this in uh, the apparel show last week. Um, the throughput is extremely fast. You know, one line of, of an attendant has a throughput of about 40 people per minute. We had 10 lines uh, that we had available for people to go through. And so we're able to cycle people into the facility safely, make sure that they can go ahead and get a PPE kit, um, make sure that they're masked, check their temperatures, and then it also allows us to meter people into the buildings safely at a, at a regulated pace to use the vertical transportation. So all of our elevators are, um, you know, marked with occupancies. Um, we have the ability to um, uh, move people via escalators. And during the peak times, we're gonna go ahead and activate 
our freight and service elevators to help move people in and out of the buildings. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about, and Karen touched on it, is just the control capacity that we have to the registration process. So obviously our success with being able to host markets and, and move people around is based on our ability to manage density. You know, so our registration or our ingress process is, the strategy is based on, you know, getting buyers and exhibitor, or I'm sorry, getting tenants and exhibitors into the building prior to the arrival of buyers and designers. So we'll set times, but you know, hypothetically, we have a, a window of period between seven and 9 a.m. where um, uh, tenants and exhibitors would enter the building. Um, we would have them enter in specific points also, most likely the, obviously the buildings that they're exhibiting in. And we would open up to buyers for a staggered uh, arrival experience starting at 9 a.m. Um, so with our registration strategy where we're you know, if we have 50% of our addressable audience um, and then we take that and we split it into another 50%, you get, you get into a, a really manageable crowd um, to where we can cycle people through, screen them, uh, and, and meter them through the facility um, responsibly with social distancing taken into, uh, into consideration. So when people are in, obviously managing the density and the traffic flow um, is, is something that we're, um, you know, constantly looking at ways to achieve and improve. Um, we've got social distancing markers throughout the facility for line queues, you know, whether those are at food service areas, obviously registration, but any kind of congregation points, we, we've taken the, the efforts to go ahead and, and um, provide social distance queuing. Uh, we've also worked on occupancy limits. So our intention, we have occupancies on all of our elevators, uh, in all of our restrooms. Um, and we're gonna be putting occupancy um, limitations or guidelines on our showrooms and our temporary booths. So all that will be based on, you know, a 50% of the regulated fire code. Um, and in some instances, we will take a look at, um, for exhibit areas, what the IAEE is doing. And, and other trade show organizations to make sure that we are implementing the best practices. Again, all of this is required for us to maintain the, the physical distancing and, uh, and the density control that we're looking for. For escalators, you know, we'll have attendance um, and some signage out that basically is promoting everybody to use every fourth or fifth step on the escalator. Again, while you're walking around like in corridors or anywhere else, as long as you have that physical separation. And if your paths cross for a small period of time, you know, the, the risk of any kind of transmission, if anybody has masks, is extremely minimal. Um, our tray choke floor configurations, we've taken all of this into account with, you know, wider corridors, uh, reduced booth density and separation. We'll institute one-way traffic flows uh, wherever it's practical. It may not be in every corridor, um, but we'll implement it in, in areas where we feel it makes sense. And obviously our common area seating, it's all been reconfigured for, uh, with social distancing in mind. So, you know, not a lot of really high tech things, um, but strategies that really, um, when you implement these measures, uh, really create an effective way for you to produce market. Um, our enhanced cleaning protocol. So, we are working with our housekeeping companies across all the different campuses are using the EPA list and cleaning products. Those are you know, recommended for and infected against COVID. Um, the housekeeping team that we're focused on high touch, high traffic areas, elevator buttons, escalator handrails, service counters, restrooms, door handles, railings, light switches, et cetera. The cleaning will be, the frequency is gonna be increased. And so is the labor resources. Uh, if there's anybody on the webinar that was here for the apparel show last week, um, I don't think our buildings have ever been cleaner. And uh, it's a testament to the, the program and the commitment from our vendors. But you know, we're, we're really focused on creating that safe environment and doing everything that um, you know, makes sense for us to go ahead and, and achieve that. Um, we're also focused on back of house areas. So our dock equipment, any kind of furniture that we put out, um, our shuttle buses when they come in, our, our, our providers are, are cleaning the buses. And I know Bob Schuler will talk about that next. 
And so um, the last thing I wanted to touch on is the egress, which Karen also talked about. You know, we have um, developed strategies where we'll have st staggered departure times. We will probably, in most instances, try to exit buyers from the buildings first and then go to tenants and exhibitors. We will most likely implement, implement where we want to have um, people in the buildings that they are in, that they exit through that building, you know, versus transferring over bridges. But we'll have a good strategy put together. Again, we have a lot of conveyance that's still available even at the 30 or 40% um, um, capacity that we have. But again, it goes back to the strategy of how many people do we have in the building and, and, and why we're splitting these sessions out to make the, um, you know, to spread the load over the days. So those are some real high level. Um, as Carrie mentioned, we have showroom guidelines that we're, we're putting together. We'll be putting more details together specific for each city and each market. And so um, be on the lookout for that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bob Schuler, who's going to talk about our, our housing, uh, food service, and, and some other of our programs that we've got in place. So Bob, take it away. All right. Thanks, Greg. Hello, everybody. I'm going to touch uh, a little bit on your experience prior to uh, arriving on our campus. And we're going to start with our hotels. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of collaboration taking place. I can tell you that uh, the hotels have been more accommodating uh, right now than I've ever experienced in my career. They simply just can't wait to welcome us all back. So whatever your brand preference, I think you're going to notice a significant difference uh, in the cleaning details and protocols uh, <clears throat> that you'll come across. If we go to the next slide, I'll give you just a small example of some of the brands and the protocols that they have in place. And what's unique about some of these brands is their protocols are, are just not buried in their websites. They're, they're on the main home page, and you'll be able to click to see their details that they're uh, producing as a brand. You'll find most of the hotels are enforcing social distancing. You're at most of their properties. Many are still requiring guests to wear face masks in all the common areas. So if this is important to you, I would suggest that you check the property specific details on their website versus the brand that you see on the screen. So know that uh, you know, we're also collaborating and we're sharing our detailed protocols with all of our hotel partners in the block. So along with the specially negotiated rates that you're getting, you know, we have a best price guarantee within our block. You're also gonna have peace of mind that you know, we're somewhat watching our hotel partners as well somewhat over their shoulder. Uh, you know, also know that you know, booking within our negotiated blocks is going to afford you several other unique features. In other words, we, we're waiving all cancellation fees, which you'll find unique across the industry right now. You, you can change your reservation. Uh, there's an incredible amount of inventory available for you right now, more selection than you probably likely have ever seen in the past for this close to a major market. So all of our bookings uh, for all of our... Hotel bookings for our markets are all open right now. Feel free to go to our website and access that through our travel page. What about airports, you might be thinking? Well, expect a totally new experience when you arrive at the airport. There's going to be fewer touch points, fewer gates in use, just fewer people in general. So if you haven't done so already, I would suggest that you make sure you have your favorite airline's digital app downloaded. They're trying to reduce the touch points and reduce paper. So expect to see a lot of plexiglass barriers at all close contact areas like bag check, TSA, food outlets, and a lot of the retailers within the airports. So get used to wearing a face mask. Uh, I know we don't sit here at home and wear face masks, but you're just not going to be able to go out and put on a face mask for three hours in, you know, uh, in a row without having some rehearsal. Practice at home. That's my, uh, my, tip, my tip for the day. Uh, you'll have maximum flexibility. Here's the good news. All the airlines are extremely flexible. Let's take Delta, for example. If you were to book a reservation on Delta Airlines already or before June 30th, you pretty much have unfettered access to make changes free of charge, even cancel if you need to do that. They're extending that capacity all the way through September 30th. So uh, for more information, you know, check with your favorite airline for more details. A lot of that is evolving, by the way. So within the next two weeks, you'll likely see some new enhancements and new changes as well, usually in our favor. Let's talk about food and beverage, right? We all have to eat. Uh, we all have our favorite catering partners and vendors. 
Uh, I think you need to have some comfort knowing that we have two fantastic professional catering partners on our campuses in Aramark and Center Plate. They're going above and beyond for you, following our protocols as well as their own. Uh, you can expect to see some of the same quality of food service, but know that all the servings that are going to be presented are going to be individually packaged freshly every single day. You're not going to see buffets. You're not going to be able to build your own Sunday bars. And you're not going to likely see unwrapped stirring sticks in yellow solo cup, red solo cups, okay? So uh, for the near future, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of individually wrapped products. Know that we're expanding our queue lines in our dining areas too to help with social distancing and accommodate the queues for you to order as well as for you to pay. Leave your cash at home, by the way. Bring your debit card and credit card. We'd rather deal with those forms of payment, touchless environment. So you'll also see some of your favorite vendors. Let's be frank, we're gonna vet them really well, but we're still gonna expect them to meet our protocol. So they'll be very thoroughly vetted. Uh, you won't see quite as many, let's say, as you might have in the past, but I assure you we've already vetted Chick-fil-A for those of you dying to have you know, their product. So for those of you looking to cater in showrooms, stay tuned. We'll be sending out some very detailed guidelines to assist you in meeting the protocols and we would strongly encourage you to reach out to Aramark and or Center Plate for some guidance. Greg spoke a little bit about shuttle buses, but we wanted to share with you that our partners in the shuttle arena are going to require social distancing and we're going to require mandatory use of face masks when you board. Now we'll have these available at your boarding points as well as hand sanitizer. So just like the airlines, buses are going to be loaded from the rear to the front and we're requiring about a 50% occupancy level within each bus. So our transportation providers are taking real careful enhanced measures to ensure that the vehicles, the buses and the scooters are frequently and properly cleaned to the point where you may actually see foggers or mechanical sprayers for some of our larger vehicles being utilized. Some of our silent partners, partners that you never really hear about they're in the background, but they're fighting and working very hard for us. We have incredible and deep-rooted relationships in each of our cities. The CVBs have actively engaged city leaders on our behalf in support of the industry with some very positive responses. You know, in Atlanta and Las Vegas specifically, which lean very heavy toward the hospitality industry, know that the support for you is unwavering for both you and your businesses. Uh, airports are eager to staff to our volumes. So we're working with the convention bureaus, with TSA, with the airport authorities to make sure that we have the right volume of attendance, the right volume of checkpoints. So we encourage you to please register and make your hotel reservation so that we can get that data to those folks in order to service you appropriately. Know that all the restaurants are starting to go from takeout to in-service in or in-room in dining and uh, their staffs have been totally retrained. Every restaurant I've been to, the staffs are wearing face masks and social distancing is fully in place. Tables and chairs have been separated. And uh, I think you're uh, gonna ex have a, a very pleasant experience uh, when you travel for market. So we look forward to your return here in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, we're going to move to the Q&A portion of the webinar and now we are about 1.48, so we're coming up on time, but we've got a lot of great questions and of course we'd like to hear from Dr. Del Rio. Um, we're actually gonna start off the Q&A with some questions for Dr. Del Rio. So Dr. Del Rio is from the Emory University School of Medicine and as Neil and others explained earlier has been an essential part of the task force um, in developing our reopening policy. So Dr. Del Rio, would you mind by starting um, um, off by explaining your role in the task force and um, overall the philosophy that, that you all have maintained as far as um, assuming that many people or all people on the campus may actually be testing, um, uh, may actually have COVID-19, but be asymptomatic. Oh, 
your, um, would you mind unmuting? There you go. My role has been to be a medical advisor and an epidemiological advisor to, to, uh, to Neil and the team at International uh, Markets. Uh, uh, the, uh, I think guiding principle, you know, again, my, my principle has been to, to ensure safety as much as possible. Here, we're trying to obviously balance a safety. I mean, the safest thing will be to close everything forever and never open again until we have a vaccine. But obviously, that simply does not work. I mean, we also need to work and we need to have jobs. And I think over the last several weeks, we've learned a lot of things about this epidemic. We've learned a lot of things about this virus. The first thing is that we know more about how it's transmitted, how it's not. We know also things, uh, we know also that this virus is here. It is not going away. The summer is not gonna go, cause it to go away. It's gonna linger with us. So it's gonna remain with us for a long time. And I suspect that we will have this virus. And as you see in the graph in the US, we're, we're reaching what I would call a plateau. So this virus is becoming endemic in our country. With some areas of the country, the virus going up, some areas of the country, the virus going down. But overall, it's, it's hard to predict, right? And if you're sitting somewhere in Montana, you probably say, well, why do I have to worry about this? But if you're sitting in, in Houston, you're saying, oh my God, the cases are going up and they weren't going up. So the epidemiology is very local and, and we all travel and we all go places. So with us, go, go viruses, go bacteria, go things, and, and the potential for transmission exists. In fact, just yesterday in China, they had a, an, a small outbreak again in Beijing, and they think it's related to, a, to foreigners coming into the country, which is what you would expect. So uh, I think what, one of the key principles here is that, that we know that transmission is primarily uh, through, uh, through contact person to person and through contact uh, by respiratory secretions. So two critical strategies are social distancing and are wearing a mask. And there's several types of masks, but obviously the kind of masks that we're recommending people use are masks that are what we call surgical masks or procedure masks. It's not the, the N95 a respirator mask. It's the kind of mask that do not prevent you from getting infected, but prevent you from transmitting somebody else. And the reason we do that is because now we know that about 30% of people with this virus are asymptomatic and they're still capable of transmitting. But also anybody that develops symptoms about two to three days before they develop symptoms in what we call the pre-symptomatic uh, uh, stage, they're able to, to, to transmit virus. In fact, they have a lot of transmission potential then. So I could be sitting with you talking comfortably, uh, you know, one feet from, from you and be infecting people. And yet I wouldn't know it because my symptoms won't develop until two or three days from now. So again, the idea of masking is really about protecting others. And, and there's a lot of nice studies saying that if everybody masks, we would dramatically decrease transmission of the virus if everybody masks when we're all together. So the principle here is again, protection, protecting the public, protecting the employees and, and protecting each other. And I think again, you don't want to come to an event, get infected and then go home and take the infection to your family. Because I can tell you as a physician, believe me, you don't want to end up, well, most people with this disease have very mild disease. Uh, some people are, don't have mild disease, they have more severe disease and they can end up in the ICU and they can die. And we've seen an incredible uh, increase in mortality from this illness in our country and around the world. So I will stop there and happy to answer any questions. We do have a couple more questions for you, Dr. Del Rio. Um, we have the question about the masks, that is it better to wear a cloth mask or the disposable mask that the market center may be providing that Greg explained you know, earlier? I think, I think I go either way. I, I like the disposable mask as well. I think the, the issue with cloth, cloth mask, my wife is very much favor of cloth, cloth mask. The thing with the cloth mask is you have to take them home and wash them every day. And if you have your favorite mask, mask that fit well, and I say, I said my wife, because particularly women, you know, with small faces may have trouble with the other masks that just are too awkward. So if you have a mask that fits with you and you like it, you know, use that. But just, you know, if it's a cloth mask, be sure to, when, you know, every evening wash it and make sure you're using a clean one. Great. Thank you. Um, and something we get asked a lot about is social distancing in elevators. Can you comment on how you can yeah. maintain distancing? You know, I, I, think, I think elevators, as long as people are wearing face masks, elevators are fine. You have a, again, we know a lot about transmission of this virus. You need to be in a close contact with a significant amount of time. And there's a really nice study from Korea in which in a call center, 
a lot of people got infected. Everybody worked on the same floor despite people being on the elevator. So nobody in the other floors got infected. So it was clearly people working in, and they weren't wearing masks at that point in time. So it was clearly people wearing, working in one, in, in one call center in one floor that led to transmission within that floor. Everybody else in that building, despite using the elevator, nobody got infected. So I think it tells us that elevators are not as worrisome as, as, I, as you would think. Now, my advice is, you know, again, if I get in an elevator, I, I wanna be wearing a mask and I would ask that everybody else be wearing a mask. I wanna say a, a, a short thing also about face shields because I'm increasingly, I would say, enamored by face shields. I find them useful. I use them in healthcare quite a bit because it prevents splashes. And some people like them because Again, they not only protect your mouth and your and your nose, but also protect your eyes. So, you know, one possibility is to is to wear a face shield, and it also is protective and, and will allow you. And if you wear a mask and a face shield, then you're doubly protected. Then you're really sort of like absolutely protected. So, if you're really concerned about getting infected, you know, wear a mask, wear a face shield, wash your hands, and you'll be fine. I can tell you, as somebody who's been working since early in the epidemic and seeing patients and taking care of people with COVID. I'm not, I'm not gotten infected following those simple rules. Okay, great, thank you. I have just one more question for you, Dr. Del Rio, before, um, before we hit two o'clock. Um, we have a question, if another exhibitor is not following IMC's protocols, how do I keep my staff safe when a buyer who has been in that showroom comes to my showroom? I mean, I think in your, in your showroom, you ask that that buyer be wearing a mask and you have all your staff in your showroom be wearing a mask. And if that environment of your showroom, all the buyers and the, the, the personnel are wearing masks, you should be fine. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example again from my own personal experience. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of my, uh, my research staffers uh, called in from home on Thursday saying that he had a fever. So he told him not to come to work Friday. He got tested, he was COVID positive. Uh, by Monday, we tested the 20 other people that worked with me, including myself, we were all negative. Why are we all negative? Well, because, because we are all wearing a mask in our research environment, in a research clinic, a very small space, we're all wearing masks when we're with each other. Uh, this employee that got infected, when we ask him, he, he likes to go out at night, he goes to parties, uh, he goes with friends, he doesn't wear his mask. So he got infected outside, he brought his infection into work, but because at work he had to be wearing a mask and we all were wearing masks, nobody got infected. So if that client, went to another place or not only another buyer. I mean, that client could have gone, you know, don't blame another customer. That buyer could have been that evening going out for a party and got infected. You know, if they come to your shop, have them wear a mask, have everybody in your shop wear a mask, you should be fine. Okay, great, thank you. Um, as, as we thought, we've gotten so many questions and we have a few more minutes. So we are going to cover a few more questions um, for the broader team here uh, of the IMC staff. So again, just know if we didn't get to your question today, we are going to um, write out the answers in a document that we will send out to everyone in, in a follow-up. So we have time for a few more questions and we are gonna go long, so please bear with us, but let's just get through a couple here. Um, this one looks like a good question for you, Greg. Um, We've talked a lot about masks today. This question is asking about how we're going to enforce the wearing of masks on campus. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's, some, it's one that we take pretty seriously. Obviously, the doctor's comments kind of set this question up pretty well. Um, but we take it seriously. and We don't intend to be passive with it. Um, we're going to be requiring that everybody upon entry of the building are masked and we're gonna require them to, to wear masks except for when they're eating or drinking. And when they're eating or drinking, they need to be socially distanced. We've got signage requiring masks that'll be posted around the common areas. Um, also the, the occupancy uh, limitations that I put, uh, that I talked about earlier, will have requirements for masks uh, there. We will have compliance uh, that'll be monitored by our personnel and our vendors. Um, we'll have roving monitors that'll also be not just looking for masks, but also trying to help maintain social distancing and ensuring elevators aren't overcrowded and escalators are properly distanced. Uh, but we're also gonna need for you know, our tenants and buyers to help enforce this with their peers. Um, we also have the expectation that all of our showroom owners, that they're gonna adopt the same policies that we have. 
uh, we're trying to provide the safest environment to keep everybody um, you know, safe and healthy. And we, we believe that they should do the same. Um, and I also think that, you know, if to Dr. Del Rio's point, people have choices to make. So if I'm a buyer and I'm going to a showroom and nobody's wearing a mask, I'm not going to do business with that showroom personally. So we believe the totality of all these arrangements will, um, will affect a positive outcome with the enforcement. We had a pretty positive experience last, uh, last week with the apparel show. And so we know that everyone's looking to, to, to do business and to create a healthy environment. Um, but those are our expectations. The only thing I will add is, you know, if, if people do see something, we want them to reach out and, and contact us so that we can, we can intervene. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, Dr. Del Rio, I have one more question for you. We have a question about whether or not you think it's safe for our customers to take collateral, giveaways, pieces of paper, and other materials from showrooms or from their visit at market. You know, again, when we started writing the guidelines, we were much more concerned about hand transmission or by touching things, et cetera, the virus surviving on surfaces. More and more CDC and others think that that, even though plays a role, plays a less important role. I, I mean, I think if you take something and you, you, you wash your hands, hand sanitize, it to me is critical, right? So if I go, if I go to the grocery store and I have to insert my credit card and touch the, the pin, pin pad, to enter my code. Before I get in my car, I, I do two things. Number one, I don't touch my face because it doesn't, the virus doesn't go in through your skin. It's, it's from your hands into your face by touching your nose, your eyes, your mouth. So I don't touch my face. And then I get, I get to my car or I open my bag and I get my hand sanitizer and clean my hands. So, you know, hand sanitizing is gonna be very important. I know the team has done a good job putting hand sanitizers all over the place. And, and simply washing your hands and not touching your face is a critical component of, of staying safe. Okay, great. Yeah, that's good to know. A lot of the order writing that happens at market is done um, through paper, paper forms. So that's, that's, good, to, that's yeah. good to keep in mind. Um, okay, this looks like a question for Neil. Neil, um, what happens if someone is confirmed positive for COVID-19 while at market, do we have contact tracing, a contract uh, tracing plan in place? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the question means by someone confirmed positive while at market. We do not have the capacity to test people on site. And even if we did, uh, the COVID tests are not while you wait results. Um, the short answer, I guess, is we have protocols in place. Mercifully, we haven't had to use them, but we have protocols in place for when we become aware that someone is symptomatic while on premises. Uh, we have quarantined areas. We have procedures for getting them safely out of the building into medical attention without interacting with others. Uh, as far as contact tracing, we will not have a great deal of information. That's the reality. Um, a, a few weeks ago, we learned roughly a week after the fact that uh, an employee of one showroom had tested positive over the weekend for COVID and he had been in the building four or five days earlier. Um, he had been screened. He was not symptomatic at the time. He'd come through the temperature screen and so forth. Um, and some tenants asked, well, why didn't you tell us? And I guess my response would be tell you what, that someone may have been COVID positive in the building at the same time you were COVID positive in a two and a half million square foot building. Um, no idea where he went. We don't know the person's name. We're not, it wouldn't be at liberty to disclose it if we were without his permission. Um, I can say uh, uh, with complete assurance that we are not going to withhold information that we have that is relevant. But without a COVID positive test, what we're talking about is somebody at market is somebody who's experiencing any of the COVID symptoms. And more than 30 years at America's Mart, I can't tell you the, the number of times we don't get through market without someone who's having an anxiety attack or uh, for some other reason is uh, having heart palpitations or short of breath or any of these symptoms. Um, we can't, and at this point have no plans to um, inform everyone in the building 
when someone has experienced the symptoms. And by the time we learn that somebody has tested positive for COVID, uh, in most cases, it will be too late. If we know, and we know where the person has been, we'll share it. If we don't, um, we won't. It's really as simple as that. Yeah, because <clears throat> there was a related question that as a showroom owner, if, if they learn that someone had been exposed to COVID-19 in their showroom at market, if they would be liable for that. There is a reason lawyers start every answer with, it depends. It depends. Uh, the, the, the legal world is changing um, just as everything else is to try to catch up with COVID. Uh, I don't know how many new laws will be written as a result of this pandemic. At this point, I can say that um, the issue of a tenant's liability uh, is no different really than the issue of IMC's liability. And I would rather speak to that because I can't give legal advice to individual tenants, but our liability is not strict liability. You are not liable um, to someone who gets sick at your place of business. As a matter of common law, as a matter of statutory law in every jurisdiction in which we operate, it's not an equation. I, I got sick at your place of business, therefore you are liable. Um, moreover, there is virtually no way to know whether they got sick at your place of business or did they get sick in the cab on the way there or at the corner bakery where they stopped for a muffin on before they came to your showroom and so forth. But even assuming um, they could establish that they got sick at market, um, it isn't an automatic liability. Uh, it, it would be a negligence question and you avoid uh, negligence or do you defend a negligence claim by showing that you took the prudent steps to um, to mitigate that risk. Uh, negligence by legal definition is the breach of a duty to another. If you're not breaching that duty, um, no liability. Therefore, the textbook answer to the question is, oh, that's a lot of words to say the answer is no, but we can't be sure it's no. Were you, in fact, taking the appropriate steps? Were you wearing masks? Did you have a hand sanitizer on the counter in your showroom and so forth? So you've got first a proof issue, second, um, the need to establish some breach of a duty. Uh, if you're doing the right things, there should be no liability that flows from that. Okay, great. Um, I have another question. It looks like it's for you, Greg. Um, is there a need to upgrade any ventilation systems across the campus? Yeah, Sarah, I, I, we, when we got into the plan details and, and studied, there's lots of different um, op options, I guess we have. The, the most effective that we found with, with both talking um, with the industrial hygienists were to increase the frequency that you're changing filters. Um, and if it's practical to go to a HEPA filtration system, and then to increase the outside air intake, which is the fresh air intake um, the percentage of fresh air that comes in and circulates throughout the facility. So as I mentioned earlier in my comments, as far as our facility preparations, we, are, we have already adopted the frequency uh, of our filter changes and um, have already increased the percentage of outside air that we bring in when we're in operation. So we believe that those, uh, those two measures are, are probably the best practices that we've gleaned from all of our research. And so we've instituted those. Okay, great. Um, and then I think maybe just one final question. It's a little general, so Neil or Greg, maybe this could be good for you, is just how, um, with so many people at market, how is it possible to keep people six feet apart in order to maintain social distancing? Um. It, it's a combination of a lot of things, many of which we've already talked about, uh, some of which are less apparent to anyone who's listening who has not been on campus. Um, staggered entry times, spreading out the attendance over a longer period of time, um, streamlining um, the places where people would ordinarily wait, the processes that would cause people to wait so that the waits are either shorter or non-existent. There are markers all over the campuses, uh, spots on the floor, lines, um, tensor barriers, um, spacing 
people out. In fact, in the area that we set up to queue people if necessary for the apparel market, it wasn't just tents and barriers, but it was pipe and drape more than head high to provide a physical barrier between you and the person in the next line. Um, there are those things. There will be places where there will be one-way traffic. Um, there, will be, there are capacities posted on all of the elevators and on the elevator floor to reinforce that. There are stickers on the floor, stand here, um, to help people stay socially distanced. There will be uh, capacities on um, the showrooms. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, some of it depends on people acting responsibly. We can do an awful lot. We are doing an awful lot to make it easy for people to follow the rules, but people have to want to follow the rules and they have to appreciate the seriousness of following the rules. Um, these are not arbitrary. We didn't come up with these rules um, because we enjoy making rules. They all have a, a very valid and, and scientifically supported reason for being. So with that in mind, um, we want to work with our visitors. We want to work with our exhibitors, our tenants, and make sure that everybody's pulling in the same direction. Great. And the only thing I'll add to that, Neil, is, you know, in all of our common areas and what we've got in our arrangements, you know, to Dr. Del Rio's point earlier, you know, there are going to be instances where people are going to, you know, casually intersect. You know, if you're in an elevator cab, which we've actually reduced our capacities by 30% and put markers on the floors. But, you know, that elevator ride for, you know, is definitely less than 15 minutes. Um, and so, but there will be opportunities where people will, you know, cross paths and, and get within six feet of each other. But the way our protocols are designed and to your points with just the density restrictions, you know, we're going to minimize, you know, exposure in that, you know, in, in that manner. Absolutely. All right, we're a bit over time. Again, we have so many questions. We will be following up with everyone after. Uh, but Dorothy, would you mind um, closing us out today? No, no problem. Um, I just, I really want to thank the whole team um, and especially Dr. Del Rio for taking the time to address these questions today. And I want to thank the hundreds of people on the phone that, that also took the time with us today to, to to listen in and to ask questions, which as Sarah mentioned, we will, we will answer in due course in writing and, and get out to all of you. Uh, important to remember that Together Safely is a living document and we will continue to modify, update and amplify the information on site as a result of changes in the environment, incoming questions from customers as time passes and new learnings from our own events and from those of others in the industry. So please check back regularly and keep the questions coming. We really appreciate your partnership, understanding and flexibility as we continue to refine our plans. Um, lastly, I would say the strength of our community, and it is a strong community, but its strength during these summer markets will depend upon our shared commitment I think we might be losing Dorothy. Okay. It was a good close anyway. It was good. I'm yep. I'm sad to sad to miss that, but um, it was a well, good it, close. Yes. Um, but just to pick up on that thought, it is the commitment of of everybody. There have been a lot of questions about what about the people who refuse. We are hoping people will not refuse. Why would you want to defend um, your decision to put other people at risk, and in fact, to to risk the efficacy of the markets at all. If, if we were to have an untoward event, God forbid, everyone is going to suffer from it, including the person who was being stubborn. So let's hope we don't have to cross that bridge. Indeed. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you to our panelists for all the information today. And of course, thank you to the hundreds of attendees who are here with us today. Really appreciate everyone's time and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.